You're listening to the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. Every now and then, we could all use a little emotional support, can't we? The last few years, more and more emotional support animals out and about, as people deal with various mental health issues, PTSD, traumas, and a slew of other life challenges. But sometimes you wonder if the whole emotional support animal thing has gotten a bit out of hand. So much so that the feds had to implement a new rule in 2020, cracking down on just what type of animals and what credentials are required, especially when it came to emotional support animals and the airlines. The rule they passed in late 2020 was in response to airline passengers trying to bring all kinds of wild and not so traditional pets onto planes, including someone who tried to bring in an emotional support peacock on board in 2018 and the comfort turkey that was actually allowed to fly on Delta Airlines back in 2016. One flight attendant said that they had seen everything from pigs to monkeys to hamsters. The problem has been that untrained animals can have behavioral issues, making for a miserable flight if some puppy is barking incessantly at 38,000 feet and, even worse, when an animal doesn't know how to hold their business and wait for the litter box. Well, that makes for a messy situation. The problem is most airlines charged passengers a hefty fee to bring their small pets with them inside the cabin. But federal law allowed people with disabilities to have service animals free of charge, including emotional support and comfort animals without defining what those are. All anyone had to do was mention the phrase emotional support animal and was giving themselves a blank check to bring on any animal that they wanted. But the new rule cracked down on this, requiring paperwork for service animals and narrowing it down, stating a service animal can be strictly, quote, a dog, regardless of breed or type, that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of a qualified individual with a disability, including a physical, sensory, psychiatric, intellectual, or other mental disability. As outlandish as it is sometimes, more and more people are looking for comfort as they deal with anxiety in a world that seems to feed anxiety. Every time you turn on the news or glance at social media or drive on the road, there's something to worry about, it seems. Jesus too said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He offered himself as our emotional support fill in the blank. And while there may be times and situations for us to seek peace in this anxious world from a variety of sources, in the end, he is our peace, our calm in every storm, regardless of the situation. And any other relief from the anxieties of this life are only temporary until we truly find our peace in him. Paul addressed this in our last passage that we looked at when he said, the Lord is at hand. He wanted the Philippians to know that in all their struggles, God was present. And though they couldn't see him, to trust that he was always there. And that this realization of faith would bring peace to any storm. We saw specifically last time that we were created to be relational and that Paul longed to see them again, especially in heaven. And that there was a conflict in the church of Philippi between two women but one that could not be solved with as they stepped into the Lord's presence with one another and put everything temporal into an eternal perspective. He also reminded them to treat one another with grace and gentleness. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. His very presence, though he could not be seen, would make all the difference. And on this podcast, that truth continues as Paul reminds them that God can cast out anxiety in any and every heart and every mind in any and every situation. And with that... We pick up today in Philippians 4, verse 6. Now, if truth be told, we all deal with anxiety every now and then, don't we? Fear of getting up in front of a group or giving a speech or being on stage. The nervousness mixed with adrenaline before a game or competition of something. Anxiety over flying or starting a new job or moving to a new place. Anxiety seems to be something we deal with when the unknown is involved or the out of control is involved. Think of it for a second. I can bet for most of us with just a few seconds of reflection, we can think of at least one thing in life right now that's causing us at least a bit of anxiety. But more and more, it seems, in addition to these small anxieties of life, those simple accepted anxieties that you conquer with some encouragement from your friends or with a few deep breaths or being overshadowed, these are being overshadowed by crippling anxieties. Anxiety disorders that paralyze some and bleed over into all areas of life. Panic attacks, causing lack of functionality, productivity, or ability to cope in many areas. Such anxiety issues are rampant and increasingly out of control, it seems. 
Paul was in a situation that was ripe for anxiety and maybe even an anxiety disorder, don't you think? In his ministry, he would go from cities and towns and he knew the conflict that he would face in each and every single one, even before he arrived. The opposition that would speak up against him, even the abuse, the stonings and beatings he might face that awaited him. Very, very anxious way of life. And now even in his imprisonment, not knowing what's to come. Will he die? Will he have a trial before Caesar like he appealed? Will he be released? Will, will he have provision as those who cared for you had to provide for you in prison in those days? In COVID lockdowns and the limitations, we've seen an increase in anxiety disorders as people wonder what the future holds about their financial situation, worry for their loved ones under emotional stress or, or relational stress, marital stress, and the continual conflict and confront, confrontation that continues to challenge our world today. Anxiety is on the rise. In fact, as many as one in three teens now in some studies struggle with anxiety. Paul too was definitely in a phase of life and ministry where anxiety was a real possibility. And so under house arrest in Rome, as Paul wrestles with and processes his own anxieties, he writes in Philippians 4 verse 6, and this is one is worth memorizing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. As quotable as this verse is, as many posters and cups and, and things in, in a Christian bookstore we've seen it on, I think Paul may have gone through a lot in order to write down these words. Because, well, for someone to write this, they have had to face a lot of anxious situations, to go through the trials and the testings, to be able to then say with authority that they could have peace and should be anxious for nothing. In order for him to pass on this advice, he had to experience it himself. Well, Paul had done that, as I'm sure many of us have, faced anxiety-ridden days and weeks and months and years, only to learn through all the turmoil that God has offered an alternative to responding with anxiety. I tell you this verse here, Paul's truth can save the world billions of dollars in pharmaceutical sales, millions of hours of therapy and counseling, countless lives imprisoned by fear, anxiety, worry, and the destructive behaviors that sometimes follow, potentially set free. Paul writes in verse six, be anxious for nothing. I like to break this word down, nothing, no thing, not a single thing. Be anxious for no thing at all. There is nothing in this world that the believer should be anxious over, not one. No thing great or small or real or imagined over which we should be or need to be anxious. Why? Well, because of what we read last week at the end of verse 5, because the Lord is at hand. Jesus spoke about anxiety and worry in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, when he told them to look at the birds of the air, that they didn't worry about tomorrow and where their next meal would come from, or to look at the flowers of the field. They weren't anxious about how they could clothe themselves, yet the birds and the flowers were well taken care of, better fed and beautifully clothed than you could imagine, and they did not worry. The word there that Jesus used is the same Greek word Paul uses here. Do not worry. Do not be anxious for no thing. It's interesting the things that maybe once caused us to be anxious. Maybe when you were a child, for example. For example, for me, flying used to cause me a lot of anxiety as a kid. I remember one time we were going to a family reunion in Arkansas and we were flying from Hawaii all the way to that family re reunion. I was probably in fifth grade or so, about 11 years old. And the thought of flying three flights across the ocean in the country, for some reason, I was really, really anxious. I remember asking my mom if there was a pill that I could take that could put me to sleep or if they had some chamber I could sleep in that would just put me to rest and I could be put on the plane in cargo and wake up on the other end just to avoid the whole process, to be transported there or better yet even to be teleported to the other side. I'm telling you the travel industry would be revolutionized if that Star Trek technology, if they could beam you up or beam you over there. But nowadays, I've traveled so much over the years, back and forth between the islands while I attended school on Oahu in college, or back and forth over the years as an overseas missionary, I've literally probably taken hundreds of flights over time. And while the process of traveling might still cause some anxiety at times as there are delays and inconveniences and other things that can be a bit stretching, the overall act of actually flying is not really an anxiety tr trigger anymore for me because I've gotten used to it. I saw in hindsight that there is really nothing to worry about. Well, we can sometimes work through anxieties by facing them head on and working through them. There always seems to be new anxieties we are faced with in the next season of life, aren't there? Or new ones that creep in, things we were totally fine with that now make us anxious. 
I used to be fine with heights, but now as I get older, I'm kind of anxious every time I'm in a situation where I'm exposed to greater heights. It's like in our fallen nature, ever since the fellowship with God was broken in the Garden of Eden, we will always find something to be anxious or worry over because we forget the reality that God is there. We're blinded to it somehow. We forget about it somehow. The fact that he's in one realm and we're in another realm and even the Holy Spirit is with us and will never leave us and never forsake us, we forget that. He is always there though. He's always in charge. He's always upon the throne. And in that reality, there's really no thing to worry about. He's got the whole world in his hands, the whole world in his hands. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 94, in the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. He recognized that there were a lot of anxieties floating around within, a multitude, too many to count in fact. And in them, regardless of the sources or the realities or circumstances of each of those anxieties, that the Lord's comforts were able to turn the anxious heart into one now full of delight. Your comforts delight my soul. It was like it didn't matter what the psalmist was anxious over, all sorts of anxieties, that the Lord had a solution for that specific anxiety. When Paul writes, be anxious for no thing, it reads like a command. Be anxious for no thing, like he's saying, just stop it or turn it off, or as if there's some switch we could flip. I mean, come on, Paul, if it were that easy, would if we could just make it happen, thanks for the advice, but it's not that easy to just say, be anxious for nothing, and it will just suddenly go away, come on now. Well, while it may not be as simple as flipping a switch, Paul was saying that there was something that could be done when facing anxiety. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Rather than being anxious and getting caught up in that state, let the onset of anxiety be an indicator to you that you need a bit more of God in your life and circumstances right now. Like the light on your car dashboard telling you you're, that you're low on fuel or to check your oil, or the indicator that comes on that, that shows the battery on your device is getting low. Anxiety is a built-in indicator or warning light that something is bigger than us, and we need to get into God's presence and meet with Him. It's telling us, hey, pay attention. Paul says in verse 6 that when an anxiety, any anxiety stirs in you, get directly into God's presence. It's time in life once again to meet with God, to bring Him into that situation, because perhaps you've been neglecting to do so or doing life on your own apart from Him in that area or thinking that it's all up to you and you can't invite him in. After all, what do we do when we are anxious? We obsess over a situation, thinking through it, playing through different scenarios in our minds, and we try to find something that we can do about it, to avoid it, to solve it, to change it. And in anxiety, we often realize that we can't do anything, at least for now. So we worry about it, thinking that if we mentally keep working on the situation, that at least we're doing something, but it's like being on a treadmill. We're getting no more, nowhere, even though we're moving. So the mind doesn't shut off because, well, at least no one can ever say that we didn't try to figure it out. The mental part of anxiety makes us feel like we're at least trying. Paul says, give that up. That won't work for you at all. Instead, be anxious for no thing, none of it, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In everything, in each of those areas, no matter, no matter how big or how small, bring it to God. This is the one part that we can do. And how do we do this? Through prayer and supplication. Prayer is simply talking with God. Supplication is asking God for help or asking God to step in and, and help or give wisdom or direction or perspective. Let those requests be made known to God, those things that you're anxious over. I like how he says that we should let our requests be made known to God because we won't always get an answer or solution right away when we pray. We can at least let our requests be made known. So what many of us do, though, is we pray for a few minutes, then we get back to worrying. Almost, uh, we now return back to our regularly scheduled programming already in progress and go straight back to worrying. In that attitude of prayer, taking time to be with God in light of that anxiety and bringing Him into that anxiety, we can come, though, truly with an attitude of thanksgiving of worship and prayer, really coming with prayer and, and supplication, not just, okay, I'm going to give my two cents to God and then go back to worrying, but in an attitude of thanksgiving. Who are we coming to and why are we thankful? Seeing who God is in light of whatever it is that we're anxious about. Are you anxious about provision? Thank God he is a, that he's a provider and that he has done that throughout scripture and in your life as well, if you take a look. 
Are you anxious about the future? Thank God that he's eternal and that he sees the end from the beginning and he has a plan and victory in place. Are you anxious about others and, and their lives and their choices that are leading them down a hard road? Thank God that he's sovereign and that he can use all things in life for his sovereign plans and purposes that we might know him better and that he's more concerned about those situations than we even are. Some anxiety in life is a result of our own bad choices and sin, our own neglect of God and his word, and now we're feeling the repercussions of those things. Partly anxious due to the circumstances that we've led ourselves into in rebellion, and partly anxious because we know there's a wedge between us and God now based upon our sin. And that anxiety brings us back to Jesus and a place of repentance, where we can thank him for the reality of the cross and the saving work of Christ once again. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, get in a position of prayer, get in God's presence. And this isn't always a quick fix prayer, though God can calm anxieties even with those. Just as the woman with the flow of blood for 12 years believed if she could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, that power would go out from him. And when she touched him, it did flow forth and she was healed, she was made well. Sometimes just praying quickly to God and acknowledging anxiety will lift things, even briefly to catch our breath. Just the other day, I was pretty overwhelmed with nothing in particular, but everything in particular, and feeling bombarded, and asked Aaron to just, can you just pray for me? I, I said that as we were driving, because I felt like it was just one thing on top of another and another, and she did, ever so briefly. But even that quick prayer was like opening the soda bottle cap just a bit. Like when the pressure has built in that two liter bottle of soda in a carbonated drink, and you open the cap just a little to let out a little bit of pressure, those quick fix prayers can do just that. So pray, reach out to others, send a quick text for prayer. But many anxieties are deeply rooted and they take seeking God in prayer, consistently even, to fully present those things to God. Paul was in prison and he had time to reflect. And all those things that were causing anxiety, he could do nothing about other than turning them over to God. So I imagine he had a lot of time to reflect on those things. Anxiety and worry usually reveal things that we need to take time to process with God. I like to process it by saying, first of all, what am I really anxious about? What's the root of this worry? Oh sure, while I might be anxious in the moment that I'm gonna be 15 minutes late to something because I hit unexpected traffic, what is the root anxiety? Is it that I'm anxious that I will be seen as being irresponsible for not leaving earlier? Or that I worry that I will not be able to come through for those I vowed to show up for? Or that I made a wrong choice by taking the highway instead of the other highway and I feel like God's sovereignty won't cover such a simple everyday choice. What's the root of my anxiety, even my simple ones? Having those honest conversations with God can actually be really revealing and really freeing as we remember that anxiety and worry are just dashboard lights, warning signs that something underlying needs to be conversed with about God. Second of all, as we reflect, sometimes it's good to really think through what can I do? What are my options? Because sometimes we're anxious because we're feeling like we have to do something and we can't always do it. But sometimes there are small things that we can do. If the Lord shows you that there's a practical, tangible thing that you can do in that moment, like write and send an email or call the cancel or make an appointment, then do that next step. But if that's all you can do in that moment, then you've done it. You've done the next step. You've done all that God has shown you to do. And now you have to just sit back, trust and wait. After that, you need to stop, release it to God and pick it up next when the step is needed. I had a pastor friend who shared once about his anxieties. He was a real type A person, a real doer. And as a young adult, the Lord had taken him to Africa and missions. And he was living off the grid basically in a tent, real front lines mission stuff. And when he got there, he got so anxious, being disconnected and almost a, what have I gotten myself into situation? And he found quickly that he could do nothing turn to nothing, to remedy the things that he was anxious about or to distract himself from the things he was anxious over. So he would go into his tent and pray, give it to God. And when peace came, he would venture out again, even if it was just for five minutes. And then when the anxiety came flooding back, he'd go back and pray again. Same thing, giving it to God, the peace would return and he'd come out again, maybe for even just 10 minutes, then the anxiety would come back. So he got back on his knees in his tent and repeating this process until the times of peace increased, going longer stints with resting in the peace of God. The problem with anxiety and prayer is that many of us never learn to bring God into the mix. It's interesting to see the rise of anxiety in teens and young adults. 
And there's a correlation, I think, between that and prayer statistics. On Pew Forum, I saw that only about 16% of young adults ages 18 to 29 say that they pray daily, and that's of those that say they pray. Other groups that are older have a larger number that claim to pray daily. Interesting enough, as life gets busier and fuller and more distracting, and prayer gets pushed out and interrupted. Is this a reason that we see anxiety and various approaches to coping with it increasing? In fact, it seems like anxiety is just something we have learned to accept and live with. As a teacher, I'm amazed at how many students tell me straight up very openly, oh, I have anxiety issues. And part of me is thankful that anxiety is being talked about because what happens if we don't respond to the fuel light? What happens if we just ignore the anxieties and keep trying to press on? I went through a real depressed season when I was on the mission field. It was rough and it was deep and it was long. I mean, I'm talking a couple years. And in my own seeking and searching and reaching out to God, I stumbled upon this verse, Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Anxiety in our hearts, when it's not dealt with or addressed or brought out on the table with God, it can cause depression. For me, this was as huge as in, as I reflected and, and sought the Lord, I started to dig down to find where did my depression start? Where were its roots? What anxieties did I just press through or bury or ignore? And it was pretty, pretty revealing, I have to say. And one of them was pretty clear. I was anxious about being lonely and being single, anxious about whether God would ever fill my need or desire for a spouse. And in that lack of faith and growing distrust and mistrust toward God, the anxiety turned into depression. And I kind of saw like that depression is surrender to anxiety rather than the victory of seeing God come through. Because the truth of it is, if we're faithful to bring our anxieties to God, God will be faithful to come to our aid in whatever it is that we're anxious about. We read what Paul had discovered for himself in verse 7. This is how God came through in his anxieties. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's what we're craving for in our anxieties, isn't it? The peace of God. Because in anxiety, there is no peace. We're being torn in every single different direction. We're being consumed with the constant worry until a solution seems to come. No rest at all. And Paul then says that the peace of God will come through. Not the peace from God, but the peace of God. You see, I see it as this. God doesn't give us something for our anxiety, like, like peace. He gives us someone in our anxiety. Himself and his presence brings peace with it. A peace that comes with God right by our side. So comforting. As I mentioned earlier, it's the whole principle behind the emotional support animal. That furry friend does not normally give something to the person but their very presence brings something to the person. The peace of God, it's him in the situation. It's like when Jesus was in the boat in the storm with the disciples. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. The boat being tossed to and fro, so unstable, be still, he said. And in his presence there in the boat, it provided the peace. And the disciples were freaking out. I mean, they were even scared even about this. Who is this? Even the winds and the wave obey, oh, waves obey him. But there was a new peace about who he was in their storm. God won't always calm our anxious storms, meaning the circumstances that are causing our anxieties will not always be fixed by God. But better to be in a storm with Jesus in the boat and experience peace, the peace because he's there with you, than to be on the smoothest sea and be crippled with anxiety. Jesus won't always fix everything to make us peaceful, but the peace of God, of him with us in that anxiety, it can bring a calm. It's a peace that we're not able to understand, Paul writes. It surpasses our understanding. First, this means we can't learn about it. It surpasses understanding. We have to experience it, which means you might have to go through some storms to do so. It can't really be explained, and some will wonder how it's even possible to have such peace. And as Jesus told his own disciples in John 14, as their own anxiety was growing, as they realized he might soon be leaving them, peace I leave with you, he said, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And the peace that he was offering was, I'm not gonna leave you as orphans. I'm gonna come to you. Meaning that the Holy Spirit, his very presence would be with them. It was the peace of God, not the peace from God, but the peace of God being there with them. 
He hadn't been able to teach them about this piece in the previous years. It wasn't anything that they had known or experienced so far, but they would know it. Second, this piece, it surpasses understanding. You don't understand how there is now peace, though the circumstances may not have changed. It's amazing when God just removes whatever it is that we're anxious over, and this happens often, as the majority of the things we're anxious about actually never even happen. Their worries just about the potential outcomes, most of which are so remote. A book that came out just a few years ago said that 85% of the things that people worry about will never happen. And a Penn State University study that was written about a few years ago in Psychology Today found that a whopping 91% of worries were false alarms. And of the remaining 9% of worries that did come true, the outcome was much better than expected about a third of the time. For about one in four participants, exactly zero of their worries materialized at all. You probably can reflect on that yourself. Things that you've worried about in the past never happened. And yet the world is still crippled by anxiety. For the one who brings the Lord into anxieties by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, there's a promise that God can provide peace even if the circumstances or the threats never change. And that surpasses our understanding. And the peace isn't just a distraction or diversion, it's a guard. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. This is speaking of a military guard. Philippi was a Roman town, and many military officials retired there in that city. They knew the strategic maneuver of placing a military guard over important posts to keep the enemy from robbing or conquering anything important. It's our hearts and our minds that God's peace can guard. And those two places, the hearts and the minds, are exactly where the anxieties usually attack and take ground and breed. Our hearts, the seat of all of our emotions. Our minds, where we do our thinking, our reasoning, our planning, our strategizing. When anxiety infiltrates our emotions, we start making erratic decisions, unwise decisions. Those that are not led by the peace of God are often the will of God. We respond in fear or, or self-preservation. When anxiety infiltrates our minds, we don't think clearly. We respond foolishly or under deception. We see things a little bit skewed and maybe not even the, in the true light. And we are all vulnerable in these areas, the heart and the mind, but the peace of God provides an impenetrable defense to the attacks on our minds and hearts. Paul mentioning the battle that takes place over our minds in 2 Corinthians 10, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I'm sure the enemy knows this, which is why when we're running around in anxiety, we, we don't feel like praying or we're too unfocused to enter into prayer. Because if the enemy can keep us from those things, from prayer, from entering his presence, from seeking him, from thanksgiving even, worship, our hearts and our minds remain unguarded. So brother and sister, when you're in that state, that's why it's so important to learn the phrase, can you pray for me? What protection that brings and what peace can come through that simple step of obedience. In this vein of protecting the heart and mind, Paul mentions on this subject to make sure that we're doing our part too. Verse eight, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Paul's encouragement to them is that knowing that there'll be attacks on their hearts and their minds, knowing that we live in a world full of anxiety prompters, understanding that there, that there are real tangible things that will try to overwhelm us, that we're to meditate on certain things. It's like he's saying, hey, I know it's flu season, take your vitamins. So your heart and minds do not get overrun with worry and anxiety. Meditate on certain things. And what are these things? Whatever things are true, the truth of God's word and from sources that are full of the spirit and, and the truth of God. Whatever things are noble, things that are of high moral principles, not debased, not carnal. Whatever things are just, things that are right and fair, viewed from God's perspective without the bias of flesh or worldly wisdom. Whatever things are pure, things that are untainted by this world or sin or, or driven by things other than God. Whatever things are lovely, things that are seen as beautiful or, or honorable by God. Whatever things are of good report, not sketchy or shady or questionable. 
if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, anything that brings glory to God and points us back to seeing how great God is, well, then meditate on these things. Paul says to feed ourselves, to input ourselves with things to counter the inundation of anxiety, that the anxiety producing messages and images and stimuli that we see every single day. Interesting, the things that we have in our world today, ever increasingly available to view or hear or presented to us. I mean, if we go by Paul's list here, it would eliminate most of our entertainment, our media, our social media, even our news. I mean, how much of it is true? How much of it is noble or just or pure or, or lovely or of good report or full of virtue and praiseworthy? Not much of it. In our anxiety overwhelmed world, how much of it is, is being brought on by the things that we feed ourselves with? letting it into the eye gate through our eyes and the ear gate through our ears. What we see and hear can cause us to be anxious, can it? I know a number of people who cut out news during COVID and it was a game changer for them. So much more peace, so much of our entertainment that we have, it's driven upon kind of this, this push to, to put us over the edge a little bit. I mean, I went to an amusement park recently with my niece and we wanted to go on the scary rides, the roller coasters, the whole time in line, that nervousness building, that anxiety building. And it's a little bit more of an adrenaline, but still kind of releasing the same chemicals into our body as anxiety and actually paid for it. There's a fine line between anxiety of worry and anxiety of excitement. And yet a lot of our, a lot of our um, entertainment and our media, it does the same thing to our bodies, releasing some of those same chemicals. Think about the creation that God has. Those things were meant to release to help us to step it up in extreme moments. And now we actually pay and make room for those things, filling ourselves with things that do the same thing to us physically, even mentally. So we have to have a balance. Is there the peace and is there the input in there? Are we putting enough of these true and lovely and virtuous things in that God's saying to counteract all the messages that we're getting every day that naturally spur us on to anxiety? I think about video games, the adrenaline rushes that come, or sports when you're on the edge. My wife needs to leave the room when her team's not doing very well or entertainment, like we like thriller shows, edge of your seat shows, true crime shows even. And as we watch sometimes, I consider what the entertainment is actually doing to my body physically. It's releasing like these stress hormones, but somehow I'm enjoying it a little bit. Are we becoming more and more addicted to anxiety just by the things that we're allowing every, every single day as we watch and as, as we listen? I'll sometimes even say as we choose a show for the night, I'm having a lot of stress and anxiety right now. Let's watch something a little bit lighter because I know that this is going to feed those same centers that are a little overwhelmed in other areas of life right now. Use this verse sometimes as a checklist. If you're struggling with anxiety, are there things that can be eliminated to help relieve that? Even practically, things like your diet, lay off the coffee, lay off the sugar when you're dealing with anxiety, but more so feeding your spirit and your mind. Are the things that you're watching and listening to true? Are they noble? Are they just? Are they pure? Are they lovely? Are they of good report? Is there any virtue? Is there anything praiseworthy? Well, if so, then go ahead, be free, meditate on those things. Prayer and Jesus are the most important parts of achieving victory over anxiety. But in seeking him, there may be things he asks you to let go of or things he asks you to do, replacing them with meditating on good things that are more conducive to peace. And most of all, it's going to be his word being in his presence through prayer, worshiping faith through thanksgiving, through song or through meditation, whatever it is to point your eyes upon him, and then filling yourselves with the pure and lovely things of his word. Meditate on these things. Now, I've mentioned it before in previous podcasts, but I'll mention it again. It's that childhood game memory where you've got the cards of the different figures or the different images face down, and you flip over one card and look at the pile and try and find another card flipping it over to find that match. And once you make the, make the match, you take those two cards and you take them off the table, proceeding on till you find another match. This can apply to many areas in our spiritual life, but I think it can apply to fear, worry, and anxiety. If there's something consistently in your life that causes you to be anxious, in prayer, ask the Lord to give you scripture. Ask the Lord to give you a promise. So every time you start finding yourself anxious over that same thing again, like the game of memory, you flip over the anxiety, you see it staring you in the face, you can find that promise and flip it over. And when you have that match, you can take it off the table. Even if it's only for five minutes or 10 minutes, you know for those five or 10 minutes, that truth, it applies to that anxiety. You can move it out of the way. And as you get good at it, you're just able to quote that scripture and remind yourself of the peace of God and stand upon the promises of God. It's a very practical way to find victory over anxiety.
Is it possible in our world today? Can we truly have peace? Well, Paul seemed to be a believer as we finish in verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, I write this to you because I've experienced it myself. I had alleviated, it had alleviated those, his anxieties. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. Seeking the Lord had been the key to Paul finding victory over his own anxiety and his worry and, and fear of all that might or might not come. He gives himself as an example here in verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. He had experienced this. The God of peace was with him and had guided him through this season, and what they had observed in his life was available to them too. If peace and freedom from worry and anxiety were available to you, would you want it? Because if we're honest, some of us are addicted to worry and anxiety. If one thing is fixed, we find another thing soon after to obsess over. Paul reminded those in Philippi and us as well of God's solution, himself. That God is in control and that when our life is in his hands, we have nothing to fret over. And not now, not tomorrow, and certainly not into eternity. As he wrote once to the Romans years before he arrived in Romans 8, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God took care of our biggest need, our need for a Savior, by sending Jesus to this earth to live and to die and to resurrect for our sins, why are we anxious about anything else? As you seek Jesus, he may lead you for help if you struggle with anxiety, counseling or support or therapy, maybe even medication in seasons. But those things are only blessed when he is the source of the peace that we seek. And they are a means to dealing with anxiety, not the cure that we're seeking. Anxiety can be masked and muffled in this world's wisdom and efforts, but Jesus can make us free. And if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That's the freedom that the world is seeking today and is available to us in Jesus, as Paul knew firsthand. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace, he will be with you. And so, Lord, we pray right now for the peace of God that will surpass all understanding. Please guard our hearts, guard our minds in Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, illuminate for each listener here the areas of anxiety and what those lights are indicating, why there's a warning light, and what they need to be uh, seeking you on, Lord Jesus. Show them where those roots are, Lord, that they might turn each and every one of those things over to you. And Holy Spirit, bring to truth, bring to light the truth that we know. Give us scripture, give us promises that tell us and will defeat the lies of the enemy about why we should be so worried and overwhelmed about that particular thing. Because your truth is greater, Lord, and your promises are fuller. Lord, I pray that we would be a peace, people of peace, a peace that surpasses our understanding, Lord, that people might look and say, I don't get why you're having peace right now in the midst of what you're going through. And it would be a testimony of you, a testimony of how great our God is and what he has done for his people, not just in light of our circumstances, but especially in light of eternity by sending our greatest need, Jesus, on the cross. And Father, I pray for anyone who doesn't know this peace, who isn't, hasn't made peace with you, who's anxious because they've not given their life to you. They're living on their own and they don't know you as their savior. Lord, I pray that they would cry out to you and ask for forgiveness for their sins, that they would ask that you would come into their life, not just as a genie in a bottle to fix their life, but to be their savior. Lord, if they've come to the end of their rope because they've been leading and they know they need to surrender, Lord, bring them to that place where they can surrender to you as their Lord and as their Savior. And God, bring people into their life that can keep guiding them and protecting them and pointing towards you as they walk on this journey with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.